All right, and we are live. So welcome everyone to our panel on implementing coherent socioeconomic policies. Uh, my name is Francis Shortkin, and uh, it's my pleasure to chair this panel. And uh, we got a set of uh, very distinguished speakers uh, with us today. Um, we have Nagraja Kumar uh, Divi, a managing partner of Divi, uh, Vit Jidlika, the president of Liberland, John Montgomery, the founder of Lex Ultima, and last but not least, Su Ming Wong, the CEO of Champ Ventures, who's uh, joining us all the way from uh, Australia. And so the, uh, the topic that we are dealing with, of course, is a very relevant one, very timely. Um, it's uh, kind of controversial in many ways because we have uh, a lot of instances around the world where you see that uh, there are significant uh, challenges where we have uh, anti-intellectualism sort of blooming, blossoming a little bit more. And I, I found a very interesting quote that I thought will uh, set us uh, sort of up for our discussion. This goes actually back to 2008 when uh, Jeffrey Sachs, who uh, I don't know if he was at that time at Columbia University, wrote an article entitled The American Anti-Intellectual Threat. And uh, in it, he actually said that anti-intellectualism could end up getting us all killed. Uh, so not exactly very uplifting. And uh, what we have seen right now, of course, as our uh, topic description also uh, suggests, um, we have essentially a really anti-intellectualism that is uh, basically geared towards just coming up with simple answers. We don't like the complexity. Uh, so we're, we're dumbing down the discussion in a way. Uh, we're throwing, by the way, some intellectual arguments. Um, and as a result, we're undermining levels of trust around, not just in the U.S., but pretty much you see it in, in many parts of the world. And um, as a result of that, you also have a strong sense of nationalism that's popping up, and uh, whether that is in, in the U.S. and in Europe uh, and maybe other parts of the world again. Uh, most recently in the U.S., we have also seen sort of mob violence in our in the January 6th incident in, uh, in the capital. Um, and so what that all does is it's sort of delaying what, what we really would need to have, which is uh, really inclusive socioeconomic policies that are really trying to address the actual problem. Because very often what we tend to see maybe is the policies that we try to implement, they really just uh, scratch the surface in a way. We're not getting to the root of the uh, issue. So in a way you could say that we're engaging in uh, maybe, if this is a good metaphor, symptomatic treatment rather than sort of radical surgery. We're not getting to the heart of the issue. And so hopefully we will, uh, in our discussions, have uh, some, uh, some ideas and some thought-provoking arguments in terms of how we can actually implement uh, good, coherent, uh, inclusive uh, socioeconomic uh, policies. So the way I would envision our uh, setup is uh, each and every one of you gets about five minutes uh, for introductory remarks. And uh, at the conclusion of that, we can uh, uh, piggyback on each other's comments, uh, ask questions. And uh, we have uh, at least one member in the audience here, I see. Um, you're also more than welcome to ask uh, questions. So I will go in the order that uh, our schedule here is, um, uh, outlines, and I'll uh, give the floor to Nagaraja. Thank you, and uh, I'm glad to be here with my distinguished panel. Uh, my name is Nagaraja Devi. I am based in New Jersey in the United States, and uh, I'm a managing partner and a senior advisor. Uh, I advise the global financial institutions um, at the board level, and I'm also on the advisory board for a number of fintech and startup companies. Uh, I also uh, adjoined faculty at a number of universities. I'm passionate about um, teaching, and also I publish the white papers. Uh, so that's a, a little bit of my background, what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. <clears throat> uh, the current topic um, is close to the heart, especially as uh, we discussed about the, the changes that's happening across the world. Um, I'm not going to the party, but I'll go to the real cause, what we're happening in the climate change, the climate risk area, how that impacts globally to across the communities. I think that may be relevant, uh, making this as more of a, a social economic cause rather than the political side. So <clears throat> uh, we, we understanding the, the, uh, 
but the movement on picked up like 2018, 2019, uh, where the dialogue at the World Economic Forum as well as the UN General Assembly when they accepted the Sustainable Development Goals, um, how it steered the conversation and the U.S. corporations started picking up um, and, and addressing uh, in, in, early, in the late 2019, talking about uh, creating a, a ESG matrix as well as uh, disclosure requirements. Um, now we are seeing the, the, the importance of the, after the elections, uh, the current administration joined the Paris Accord. So there's a multiple factors that are influencing the uh, environment and sustainability and governance uh, that all the businesses across the world are moving towards uh, protecting the planet and reducing the carbon emissions by 2030 and 2040. So uh, ESG is, is kind of a moonshot initiative, I would say, uh, how we actually come and, and to rescue the planet for the future generations. So I'll stop there. And uh, once we start the conversation, then we, I, I'm happy to address uh, the discussion. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. And so I'll, next I'll give the floor to, uh, to Vid. Thank you very much. Um, it's a great pleasure, Francis, to be here as always on Horace's meeting. And uh, as I told you, I've taken active part in the whole event and I've been surprised how much the global warming was used in all, uh, uh, basically always. And, uh, and I'm also uh, surprised, you know, how, how, how it has actually polluted the debate enormously. And that's why I shared you the quote, which I think explains exactly how the elites or intellectuals are viewing the problem of the global warming. But I'm not going to go into that. Uh, I decided long time ago I'm not going to focus on the fact that uh, that you know that uh, basically the elites or intellectuals of the world see the humanity as the problem uh, itself, and that there is this strong push for reduction of the population by many people around the world. That's not why I'm I'm speaking. Was, uh, attention because we are aiming to become the, the freest country on this planet, a country which will not uh, charge a carbon tax or it will not uh, stop you from visiting your relatives. It is a country which uh, will truly respect personal freedoms of the people as well as their economic freedoms. And I have this uh, in my one of my presentations which I've put forward as well, this kind of great comparison between the climate change impact on the economy of the EU and the impact of regulations. Uh, and it's um, unbelievable to, just to compare the two, right? So the, the IMF and the World Bank expects that the global warming will slow down the economic growth by uh, 2100, year 2100 by 4%. And uh, the regulations, regulations, for example, in EU are slowing the economic growth every year by 4%, right? So we have this drastic impact of 4% by global warming in 80 years, compared to this, I would say uh, it's even uncomparable, right? Because it's happening every four years. And you know how the exponential growth works. That means because of the regulations that are supposed to protect the customer, protect the businesses, uh, you know, the society is becoming 4% poorer every single year. And that means the whole society will be 20 times poorer over the next 80 years because all of these regulations are in place. And when I kind of understood this, I understood a little bit the context of the global warming um, thing, I decided it's time to really we don't have any chance to fight this. Like this all is embedded in people's minds. And the, the best way is to simply go ahead and create a new society based on people that understand these principles, that believe in freedom. And that's on, on 13th of April 2015, we started a new country based on the similar principles like the American Revolution. Uh, we decided that the state should not do anything else a part of taking care of security, justice, and foreign relations. And uh, I truly believe that this approach is, is going to bring us uh, the maximum prosperity that society can reach. And right now, 
we are pushing together a blockchain governance for all this. Uh, it's not the most important part, but it's important part of the technological technological element that is added to Liberland. We are actually utilizing Polkadot technology to put our governance and our constitution and our courts and our company registry on. Uh, so I think we will be the first national state running entirely on blockchain. And, and that's about it for the introductory from me. Thank you very much. Um, and moving right along to, uh, to John. I think you're muted, John. Uh, uh, no, you're good to go. I'm, now I'm back. Um, well, I'm going to I'm going to go from the, the 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 grand vision of a new nation to sort of mundane uh, systems change principle. And you know, in terms of um, changing or, or rebooting the. Uh, socioeconomic policies for the, for, for the world. I'd like to start at the at the sponsoring costs. What are what are the guiding principles of the current you know socioeconomic system? And I think the neoliberal agenda from the Mont Pelerin Society after after World War II that that cooked up the recovery plan for uh, Western. World War II, those those principles have, have basically guided the global economic system, and um, for the, for those of us that are in the in the camp that uh, the current neoliberal economic principles um, are over the long haul unsustainable, the starting point for any uh, reformation of, of the economic system is identifying the guiding principles and then figuring out what what principles um, should replace them and I don't necessarily have the answers but what I what got me into this was as a corporate lawyer I realized that the corporation that we know and love has no social and environmental conscience under under Delaware law it is required to maximize stockholder welfare and it it pursues profit at the expense of society and the environment and and you know that's been likened to to uh, sociopathic behavior and my thought to reform the economic the socio the, the economic system was to endow the corporation with a conscience i i figured that would that would change everything so we identified the smallest possible change we needed to make to corporate law to endow the corporation with a conscience. And it's essentially two sentences in the corporate code. You extend the, the fiduciary responsibilities of directors to all of its stakeholders, and you require the corporation to operate in a responsible and sustainable fashion or to provide a material positive impact on society and the environment. So I think in order to avoid just arranging the deck chairs on the Titanic, I think any discussion of rebooting the, the economic, global economic policy should start with what are its guiding principles. Thank you very much. And uh, last but not least, uh, Sumi. Thank you, Francis. Um, I'm going to sort of cut the middle way between Vid and John. Um, I think I'm taking the Australian as a very uh, blessed is now an Australian citizen uh, that live in a society that I think has been uh, a compromise, a very sensible compromise between Vic's idealism of unlimited personal freedom. And, and I, I think we as Australians have one saving grace is that our voting system is compulsory. And, and that tends to, I mean, I, I can't say there's evidence to back it up, but anecdotally, has saved Australia from the extremities of populism, whether it's left or right, because we are very much a middle ground, consensus-driven society at the end. You hear outbursts of populist 
sentiments from both sides all the time. But the way we have coped with the pandemic in the last 18 months or 12 months has spoke loudly that when we were pushed to put a commitment above personal freedom, we deliver on the community well-being first and foremost. And the second thing that I, I, I would like to sh sort of throw around there to, to discuss is given the technology evolution that we've we lived through and the amount of politicization of every ideas that we have uh, has been quite, quite corrosive. I, I, I praise the Australian response to COVID-19, but I am despairing about the climate change debate in this country because it lived through there. So I think the simplistic way, Francis, about popularism is that and anti-elitism -elit is not, I don't think there's anti-elitism in the way that we think about it. It's just that social media has distilled complex argument into 140 characters or whatever you want to call it. And it's difficult to solve complex situations with that sort of simplistic argument. And it's beholden on the community, not just the, the intellectuals or the elites in the commas, to to sell the messages. And again, I say, you know, think about the Australian response to the pandemic. It's really a, a, that when you the push comes to shove, we as a community will rise up. rest my case about the need for community well-being. Two other things, I mean, you know, which we haven't talked about. I, I really don't feel that this forum is to cover climate change to that detail, but it's more about equality. And John's point about ESG is very pertinent. I, as, a, as a professional that is dealt in the, in the finance industry, I have not seen the amount of momentum behind the need to implement ESG. But my fear is that we, we become a box ticking exercise, like IFRS is going to implement ESG standard and, and God help us if we just get the accountants more involved. So we apologies to accountants among us. being exported to, to Asia or other lower cost country, that is a direct outcome of globalization. We enjoy the fruits of globalization because low inflation and our consumption good hasn't gone up at all markedly in the last three decades. But the price of that is that the old sort of meat level jobs are disappearing. And I don't have solution to that. Mm -hmm. Again, those are the two issues that I like to put on the table for, for the panel to cover. The good and bad of globalization and how can we make a more just and equal society. Thank you, Francis. All right. Well, thank you very much. So there's a lot of different uh, arguments and ideas that are sort of put forward. I, I guess if I if I zoom in on, on one uh, theme, maybe it, it sounds to me, and, and feel free to to chime in and um, and, and, and correct me or... or, or um, um, challenge me, um, but maybe what what I would suggest we can look at is: Would you agree that maybe the biggest challenge that we're facing in the world today, in terms of coming up with inclusive socioeconomic policies and, and developments, might be that there's this growing divide, the societal divide we we see in various countries that might be perpetuated by globalization, where people are feeling that they're being left out, their voices are not being heard. Um, and at the same time, to, to Su Ming's point also about the, uh, the, 
the trend that we're seeing right now, the, the overbearing influence of social media and how people are sort of seeing issues being framed in, in very, very narrow perspectives, totally decontextualized at times. Do you feel that that is at the heart sort of contributing to this challenge of coming up with coherent socioeconomic policies? Because we can't, we can't seem to have a debate where where people are not even willing anymore to listen to alternative viewpoints. Uh, are we maybe too polarized as a society, uh, maybe globally or within a particular uh, country, that uh, this polarization, and I look at it from the U.S. perspective, one, uh, it is extremely polarized right now, where, um, you know, if you're not um, exactly towing the, the same line as me, well, then I have to be opposed to you. How can we sort of craft a, uh, an environment that brings society together to look at that middle ground? Because I think that's once we can converge on that, we might have an ability to, to build on that foundation, if you will. Do you see any, any prospect of that happening? And if, if not, you know, what could we do to, to right the ship, so to speak? I see um, one of our audience members is uh, is leading from the emergent future, and that implies that she is affiliated with Otto Schumer's work. And I think um, one of the things I love about Theory U and and Dr. Sharma's work is that he he just names the par part of the problem, which is we humans are horrible at leaning into a disruptive future. And what we're, what we're collectively facing is a, is a future that can be very frightening. You know, we've got global warming, we've got income inequality, we've got populism, we've got, you know, the displacement of people from, by globalization. There, there are lots and lots and lots of issues. And that kind of uncertainty triggers you know, a, a fight or flight or fight or flight response in people. And that that shuts down our ability to lean into the future and really embrace the process. So what do we do? We tend to we tend to shrink into our tribes. We you know, we we we, we go for simplicity. We we um, you know, we we go go back to we either do more of the same that isn't working um we we um try harder or or we we make blank great again and so part of part of what we need to do is is get out of fear get and and really accept where we are and embrace the and embrace the process of of of, of leaning into whatever change is going to be required in order to to take civilization to the next level. Okay. Yes, Nagarajan? Yes, I have a very optimistic view on this, and I uh, agree with what Sue has mentioned about how the U.S. demographic in the middle of the country, uh, not the East Coast and the West Coast, but how the globalization has impacted the middle of the country. Uh, the jobs have been either taken away or being uh, move to a different country, so the rest of the world become wealthier uh, and increase their GDP and, and, and the national average growth, but whereas in the middle of the country, almost the 200 million people uh, don't have the future. Uh, that's the reality. So that, in my view, uh, translated in, in the two years, four years before the elections and the promises for the current administration. So. Um, I think I'll just leave it there from the, the political point of view, but that's a real impact of the globalization in the U.S. I've been in the U.S. last 25 years. Uh, when, when I came from India 25 years back, I have seen how things have changed. Um, I lived in Chicago, Austin, Texas, California, now in New Jersey. So I've, I've seen uh, the length and breadth of the country and, and the prosperity and how certain segments of the communities uh, literally becoming poorer and poorer. Uh, the second aspect is why I'm so optimistic about 
the, the future when we're, we're talking about a lot about the governments and we talk about bringing, I think one, one thing we missed out in, in my uh, statement is when we bring uh, the women workforce into the society uh, where their contribution uh, will will exponentially increases the national uh, growth almost like a 20 trillion dollars in a year's time in, in a rough estimate and how we bring the women into the workforce and and giving the leadership role i think that's accountability and and, and transparency is lacking so that's where uh, in the financial services when i see the number of women executives who are taking the lead roles becoming the ceos that's a promising one that's an optimistic view I see, you know, things are changing in the right direction. Maybe it's a slow, uh, but eventually we'll be there in the next five, ten years. That's my view. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else would like to chime in on that? So it, it sounds the as being optimistic. Yeah. Am I am I clear now? Sorry. Yeah. The, the hotel internet might not be the best. Um, look, I'm optimistic as well about the future, only because I, 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 we talk about the the downside of the technological advancement that we have, but the upside is that our children and grandchildren are so much brighter than we are, so much smarter than we are, so much more aware than we are at their age. And and our, my son is a is a technology coordinator in a in a sort of hot house high school here in Melbourne, and he shared with me that he teach a class of twelve years old, and these are super bright kids and how cooperative they are, and and he was and uh, he's a pretty my son is a pretty optimistic person and he's very hot you know like millennials. They are really big on the climate change and social good and things like that. And for him to say that he feels heartened by the fact that his 12-year-old students giving good advice about the future, that, that says it. I, I think sometimes we can look at the big picture, whether it's you know, the warming of the climate or the, you know, the, 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 you know, where I sit looking at the U.S., the, the divide between the blue and the red. I just shudder to think where are you going to come up with a compromise? Uh, but when I think at a, at a personal level, the amount of optimism and positiveness is, is quite, quite encouraging. I'll finish up by saying that one of my passion, you know, apart from being a successful finance management business, is really about Thirty years, and I do not want that to to fall away. And I can sense that if the economy starts to slow down, the inevitable racism and xenophobia will come into play. Mm -hmm. And that's why I'm passionate about this session about social economic policies because of that. That it has served me well and my family well, and I like to give back. So there's deep personal commitment to that, and. I think I, I'm, I sense that among all of us here, there is that desire to do, to do, and, and to enhance the society's cohesiveness. Thank you, Francis. So, piggybacking off of that, and, and maybe um, uh, the, a question or a comment sort of directed to Vit, and, uh, and feel free to, to share your thoughts. Being involved with a very young country. And, and and looking at this uh, notion of uh, you know cultural tolerance, uh, diversity, uh, and and bridging the, the boundaries, as it were, between different groups of people to get them to uh, look beyond their differences and actually look at uh, at the all human beings as sort of part of humanity and get them to cooperate towards you know, addressing a certain issue. Or, or a challenge. What uh, what do you see in terms of you know, your vision for uh, for Liberland in terms of fostering that kind of uh, I guess sort of uh, 
call it maybe global citizenship idea. Uh, is is that what we would need to sort of maybe instill in uh, in uh, the generation, the future generations, to help address those socioeconomic divides that we see right now? So we need to have that greater understanding, the tolerance for different viewpoints. Well, first of all, you know, like Liberlanders are really coming from all parts of the world. They are a group of people that uh, I think form the best nation, like nation on the best possible principles. And those principles are belief in the freedom, right? And those are the same principles that the United States were based on, right? And the uh, nation, you know, they say that it's based on common culture or a common religion or, or common, uh, I don't know, or whatever. But it's not, you know, the best nations and best countries are actually based on common belief how to govern themselves. Uh, so from that perspective, there is a couple, couple uh, outlets that said that we are the most empowered, ideologically empowered nation in the world. And I truly believe that this is actually the biggest asset of Liberland. And uh, so, yes, we are nationalistic. We are nationalistic in the belief that government shouldn't come to our lives and shouldn't meddle with our business. And, and this is probably, probably you can see this very closely also in Switzerland, where the, the thing that, that binds the Swiss people together is a common mistrust in politicians, right? That's actually the strongest national element. You know, whenever you give power to somebody else over your life, you end up being, uh, you know, where you, where you are supposed to be. You're, you know, you're going straight to have troubles because the politicians will always misuse their power in order to control your lives and try to get some extra advantage out of it. And I really like this uh, quote from Lord Moncton that the power corrupts and the ultimate power uh, corrupts ultimately. That's a great argument against centralization of powers into the, some big power centers, right? Whenever you try to put number of countries under the same rule, under the same governments, and you give some people which are completely anonymous for, for the voters, a lot of power, you always end up with having a very corrupt system. It's inevitable. It's actually built into the system. So my my wish is to have, for example, Europe made out of thousand Liechtensteins. I know that the prosperity and happiness of people living in Europe would be much, much greater in that way. And, and peaceful, loving uh, thousand nations where you can choose under which jurisdiction you want to live in and where these jurisdictions would actually compete between one another to provide better services for better price. So you know this is this is the thing where I'm where I'm coming from, uh, and uh, you know maybe just get a little bit back to the global warming because it is really dominating the debate so much. Uh, I just shared with you an audio book which has uh, which was co-authored by President Václav Klaus, the former president of Czech Republic, which I kind of share some opinions on the topic with. It is a great uh, 350 pages of of um, polemics. And, and it's a deep polemics because what I really believe that the, the global climate debate has become completely superficial. It has become more like a, a, a let's say, modern day cult, which is kind of stressed under every in every conference, and it has become like a cultural thing. And and you know, I know it's not helping me on the diplomatic level, but I just have to speak up about this, and that's why I'm involved in publishing of this book because we really need to get back to our senses and have some reasonable debate. And when you when you look uh, into, for example, what the World Economic Forum has published recently, how great it is that, that there are lockdowns and now... ...economic activity because we are somehow uh, helping to save the environment, but but in that sense, we are really getting into an awkward situation where the elites of this world are openly hostile to freedoms and to happiness of the people on this planet. So it sounds as though ultimately, to come back to the point that um, I think, John, you had uh, alluded to that a little bit of, sort of disruption, <laughs> right? That uh, so the, the world we're living in is well, it, it's defined by disruption. It, it always has been, and I guess the question is always how do we react to uh, to disruption? Do we adapt, or do we uh, sort of retreat and say, well, you know, I I, I like the the way things are. You fall back on your default position, 
And I guess then the question, the challenge, Ravel, would be that um, we need to find a way to foster an environment that is conducive for people to to embrace disruption, not be afraid of it, but also give them the the tools and the mindset to uh, to talk to each other to come up with creative ways of of addressing the challenges of of tomorrow. And um, from my own discipline, um, I would argue maybe then uh, part of the, uh, the the challenge will come with how we frame and how we approach the education of future generations. You know, what kind of skill sets do we give them? Do we um, present them with, uh, or do we train them to be comfortable with uncertainty, with disruption? Uh, do we prepare them for a world that takes them out of their comfort zone? And maybe that might be one way. Uh, I don't know if you have any uh, any thoughts on that. Uh, we have about four minutes left, so maybe we'll use that as sort of a uh, a, a closer, if you will. Or any other thoughts that you want to share? You don't have to necessarily um, answer, um, you know, what I just uh, asked. But well, I've got two kids, two small kids, jumping around me while trying to keep them calm because they came with the mother a couple minutes ago. And I can tell you, you know, David is doing great. He's got you know, the Khan Academy for kids, and he can educate himself on the road. And I think he just mastered like your first and second class of education over the last two weeks because he really enjoyed the application. So. I think, you know, I think this is the answer. Like, we really have a new generation of kids which is going to develop much faster, especially because of all the tools for education, uh, interactive tools for education, and I'm very optimistic about that. And, and of course, in Liberland, we don't have any obligatory education for our citizens. Uh, I'm happy that we have a first university, the Free University of Liberland, that is launching in September. Uh, but a, a part of that, you know, we are not giving out licenses. We are not forcing our parents in Liberland to put children in schools, etc. I can just add um, 20 seconds to one minute. I think education is the key. That's where uh, my passion into the academia and also reaching out to the student communities where I mentor and, and, and help them to, to grow, uh, not just in academics, but understanding what's happening around the world. Uh, when 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 um, when John was mentioning about disruption, I think the technology is the key disruptor. And and over the centuries, almost the evolution of the human uh, beings, we've been part of the disruption. So every hundred years, things will change, and the AI in the future will be a disruptor. And and how we live and breathe, maybe you know, we, we are not accepting the machines as part of our life. But maybe, you know, it embraces uh, to the machines part of our life in the future. So, uh, but we are a long way, but uh, I think um, we've been in a good hands with the machines too. That's what I, I think. Thank you. John or Suming, do you want to give some final comments? Sure. Just on the educational system, I think... Um, you know, we, we need we need to teach people how to think critically and how to think out of the box. I, I just took I'm just finishing up a, a, a master's program in in organizational leadership that um, I was um, optimistic. It was it was it was called the uh, the arc of purposeful leadership. And I thought it was going to be um, uh, germane to the times, but it was largely uh, the the Harvard Business School leadership approach um, delivered without challenging the the context in which leadership is being applied. And so, um, you know, how do we how do we teach people how to engage in systems thinking and, and redesigning systems? I mean, we've got Vit here who's redesigning a country. Um, you know, it, it, it's it's really um, helping helping people in the educational process learn how to think critically and think out of the box. I think that's a huge skill. Suming, no, I just endorse what John said. I think the the rope blending and the facts digestion approach has its limitation as you fast changing world. 
the ability to have the social skill and the interpersonal skill to adapt is always a trump over everything else. I just give you my own personal business.